He didn't say anything. He says, if God says so, I don't need to understand how. It's his business how. My business is to trust him. Abraham believed. Well, <clears throat> let's continue a little. The, the, the song said that he changed me completely. Do you believe that? Okay, how many of you have been completely changed? You are perfect. I want to know who is perfect. I tell you, nobody is perfect and I am nobody. <laughs> how does it happen? Does it really happen? So to, to give you, to, to make you smile a little more. I was young. I was born with too many ideas in my brain. All the time, never lacked ideas. In fact, I had way too many. People would talk, and before they can finish talking, I already had a thousand ideas about what they said and how to twist it around. And for instance, the pastor had a youth prayer meeting, and all the youth of the church were there, and he talked about last day events, and he talked about spiritualism, and Satan is going to come and bring fire from heaven. And, and by the way, that's our subject tomorrow. Right? And, and, and the youth were like scared to death. He said, if he's there, don't go. Don't go, he's dangerous. And one of the girls says, Pastor, what should we do then? You pray, you don't go there, you don't fight Satan. And I thought about it. I said, man, after two hours of talking about Satan, these kids are scared to death. What if I scare them a little more? <laughs> so I get up and I leave. Pastor says, Pavel, where are you going? Oh. I ate too many plums today. He said, oh, okay, go. <laughs> I went outside. There were workers fixing the church, remodeling. I got one two by four. Another one cut it in two quick, put a screw in the middle. Another one cut it in two, put another screw. I made the, the person, the hands, the legs. And then I put a screw behind the neck. And I put a fishing line. And in front of the exit gate from the church, it was a a tree that was big, big. And I threw the fishing line behind the branch and then pulled the scarecrow. Oh, I forgot to tell you, I took a costume from the painters that were painting the church and it was all spots of white on the blue. Can you imagine? And I put a hat, like the, the, the brother that played the violin, I put a hat and I got the, the thing in the tree and then I went into the garage of the pastor and I was waiting with the other end of the fishing line. And when they came, it was at about 8.30 p.m. When they came from the prayer meeting, talking about Satan and spiritualism, and they got under the tree, I dropped the scare line right in front of them, <laughs> one meter above the ground, and then I started to pull and drop. And it was doing this. <laughs> and one of the girls screamed, Satan is in the tree! <laughs> and all the youth ran back in the church and said, Pastor, pray for us, Satan is in the tree. And he said, what are you talking about? He dropped from the tree in front of our faces. And he said, where is Pavel? <laughs> <laughs> and then guess what happened next? The pastor called mom. <laughs> as always. And mom went to dad when he came from work. He's crazy. This kid is not, never going to change. And guess what my father did? As usually. He gave me a hug. I said, I did it too. I just, I, I, got nev I never got caught. <laughs> and then he said, because people would call them and say, he will never change. He's crazy. Every day they called from school, from every, I could give you a thousand stories like this and I mean it. And they would say, he will never change. And my father looked into my eyes. My mom was crying, he will never change. He's crazy. And my father looked into my eyes and said, my father prayed for me. And God transformed me, and I am still growing. And Jesus lives in me, and he changes me every day. And I am praying for you, and God is going to take all these ideas and use them for something good. So I have great hope because I am praying for you. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. And my mom would say, you encourage him? And my father said, no, no, no. God's grace is so great to me, I cannot help but do the same to him. And my father would say, how could he know Jesus unless he sees God's grace in us? 
He needs to know God's love, and I'm going to show it to him as God shows it to me. Isn't that beautiful? God's grace is so great. Do people change? How does it happen? We go to church every Sabbath. We go to camp meeting. We listen to so many sermons. And we still seem to struggle, don't we? And then what we do, and this is very sad, we talk about grace, but practically try hard to change through works. And we replace God's work with our work. That's paganism. You follow me? Cain brought his works before the Lord as means to salvation, and Abel brought the sacrifice representing Jesus as the means to salvation. Which one was accepted and which one was rejected? Because Cain worked really hard for that sacrifice. You follow me? Yet, God rejected. Because there is no way to be saved through what you do. doesn't matter what you do. You may be superman, you super car, eat super food, and have super glue. doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. Whatever you do, you still don't deserve salvation. Whatever you do, you can never pay for Jesus' blood. You can never pay for eternity. How in the world can you pay in a life of 50, 60, 70, 80 years? Forever and ever and ever eternal years. How can you? You understand? There is no way to pay. Whatever you do is so small. And not to talk about what the Bible says that our... What type of... Is like filthy rocks. Our... Our... What? It doesn't say dirty? Act, it says righteous act. Our best deeds are... How can you pay with them? Do you understand what I am trying to say? We will never be able eternally to pay for what God has done for us. We will never. Jesus' blood on the cross, God himself suffering, eternal life uh, and glory forever, we will never be able to pay. And yet we try to pay God. And we do this and that to feel good. And if we sin, we don't feel like, I cannot go to church because I sinned. And I cannot pray before I behave somehow so I can deserve to go to prayer. That's really foolish. It's like saying, I cannot go to the doctor because I am sick. I wait until I get well and then I go. It doesn't make any sense, does it? And so, how does it really work? How does it really happen? How do you acquire righteousness? Is it fair that Rahab, that was dedicated to the temple of prostitution, and I could go in history a little more, Rahab, could be saved. The woman at the well, you remember? What, did, what was her job? The whole city knew her. You know what I mean? Could be saved. The thief on the cross could be saved. On this hand, on the other hand, you have Isaiah, you have John the Baptist, you have Paul, you have Abraham. They are both saved. I mean, these people in the left, they really don't deserve it, do they? Yet, they are saved. You work all your life, go to church, sing kumbaya, eat broccoli, and then somebody comes in the 11th hour and gets the same salary. Is it fair? That salary is not what you work for. And we will explain it. How does it happen? Is it possible to change? Is it possible to be saved? How does it work? Salvation is not an action. Salvation is a person. Did you hear me? Okay, let's continue a little. If we take, let's say, by the way, that's the wrong presentation. It's as righteous as God. So, now if you want me, I can change it, but I started the other one. <laughs> okay, so how do you acquire righteousness? I'm going to give you a quick, quick, quick story. I don't know how to say it quick, but anyway. <laughs> So, probably some of you heard the story before. I was in university. I organized, I called, I didn't organize, I called the youth from one of the biggest churches in Bucharest to meet together and pray. 
and we started to pray for revival. And we started to pray for uh, some of the church friends or relatives that were not coming to church. And some parents that they knew my parents and the grandparents knew my grandparents and the children knew me and my sisters that we grew up together. The parents called me and said, our daughter, your friend, stopped coming to church. Thank you. That's the presentation. Stopped coming to church. Not only that she stopped coming. Did I tell you the story? No, I told it at the youth tent. Not only that she stopped coming, but she got into really bad stuff. I am not going to explain the stuff, but extremely bad. And she doesn't want to talk about God. And if we mention God or church... She doesn't even greet us. She said she's going to change her phone, her Facebook, her whatever, her address, and she will never talk to us again. So the youth group, we started to pray for her. And we pray, Lord, how can somebody so bad that doesn't want to hear about you can change? Can somebody like that change? If you changed a persecutor, Paul, then you can change this person too. But for sure you respect people's choice because God gave us freedom of Exactly. And so, Lord, we are going to pray and we are going to ask not only that you work, but you give us wisdom so we can work. So we prayed and prayed and prayed for several months. And then I called the parents. I said, listen, I realize that I cannot talk to her about church because she's going to hang up on me. I cannot say, you need to repent and sin no more. I cannot do that. So I said, tell me what she likes. Oh, she loves mountains. I said, I got her because I love mountains. How many of you know the story? Pretend you don't know it, okay? And so I said, I love mountains. I called her and I said, hey, how are you doing? And she says, who is there? I didn't say, uh, they call me Luke. I didn't say Luke. I didn't say Pavel. I didn't say your friend. I didn't say your neighbor. I didn't say your I said, I'm your enemy. She said, what? I said, don't what me. And she says, what do you want? To make your day miserable. She said, what? I said, I told you not to what me. Because if I would say, I called you to come to church, she would hang up. If I would say, I came to, I call you to, to I want to help you, she would hang up. I, I, I just said, let's, let's challenge. And I said, I want to make your day miserable. She said, how can you do that? Very simple. Do you like mountains? Yes. I said, you are a baby. I can beat you in anything you talk about mountains. And she was very competitive. She says, no, you cannot. I have climbed every possible mountain in Romania. I said, you are a baby. I said, do you know the cross? Karaiman? She said, yes. I said, you do? Yes. I said, have you climbed that vertical wall? She said, that's impossible. I said, are you kidding me? I said, I've climbed there and there and there in that part, in that part. And one of them, the youth from the church watched me, wa was watching me when I fell from the mountain. And that's secure death, basically. It's vertical all the way down. You, you know, I fell and the hook from my shoe, I had shoes with hooks and the shoelaces would go behind the hooks. The hook from my shoe got caught in the hook from my friend's shoe and I was like a pendulum, head down, hanging from the shoe hook, moving in the wind. And she said, that's a lie. I said, I have pictures. <laughs> she said, you are crazy. I said, do you agree here? And my friend got a stick and he was hanging from the vertical wall and put the stick. He said, stop moving. And I said, it's not me, it's the wind. And slowly I got my hand when I grabbed the stick, my shoe, whew, and my legs. Whew. And then I was hanging the whole body like that. And then I was trying to get a place in the rock. And the youth from the church, they were going on that road like an S, like a Z. And they were at the end of the road. And the pastor and his wife and the youth were looking. And the pastor's wife started to scream, Lord, please save Pavel. <laughs> anyway, and she says, you are crazy. I told you that I can beat you in any mountain. And then I said, how many mountains have you been? And she said, all. I said, no, you have not been in Borja. Or you don't have that mountain. And she didn't even know that those mountains exist because they are not in the touristic map, you know. And I said, hey, we are going to go to some mountains that you don't even know that they exist. And hot springs come from the ground. And there is a place with a lake that is with iodine. And if you go in it, it's so cold that it's like you are dead from that place down. You don't feel and the, the waterfalls. And, the, and she says, wow, who goes? I said, we, the group. She says, who? I said, well, a group. She says, you are the group from the church. <laughs> I said, yes, I'm not coming. 
I said, you miss it. No, because you want me to get baptized. I said, actually, I don't want you to get baptized. She said, you should. No, I said, I don't, because if you come, you are going to teach the youth to be stupid just like you. So I said, please don't get baptized, because if you say, please get baptized, she would hang up. So I said, please don't get baptized. And she says, you promise that you are not going to ask me to listen to your sermons and your prayers and your songs and get baptized? I said, I promise. In fact, if you come, I'm going to ask you to leave. <laughs> she said, then I am coming. <laughs> we went in the mountains. It took a, a while, train, and then a, we, rent, we paid a truck driver that would carry trees to get us as far as possible up the mountain. And then we walked for about two days. We got to the top of the mountain. We pitched the tents. And as soon as we finished pitching the tents, she went in the tent. I called the youth. We started the fire in front of her tent and started to sing and to preach. <laughs> she comes out. You promised you'll not teach me or you'll not tell me about Bible. I said, am I telling you about Jesus? What are you coming out? Get back in your tent. <laughs> she took down the tent. She moved the tent. As soon as she moved the tent, it took her two hours. We moved the fire in front of her tent. Started <laughs> to sing Kumbaya and to preach again. She came out, she moved the tent third time, it was already night, she was tired, we moved the fire again. She says, I cannot move the tent all night. I said, then stop moving the tent. <laughs> but I don't want to listen to your sermons. I said, then cover your ears. She went in the tent, she was angry, but she had no choice. And I was talking about Mary. And I was explaining how Mary, when they dragged her to Jesus, and they wanted to kill her, Jesus said, what did he say? Where are your? And she looks and she says, nobody condemns me. And Jesus says, but I do because you deserve to die. Did Jesus say that? No. Did she deserve to die? Yes. But Jesus says, I do not condemn you either. Do you remember? The no condemnation gift, if received by faith, becomes in you no condemnation to others. And if you condemn others, it's because you have never understood the no condemnation gift. Because the more you walk among flowers, the more you smell like flowers. You know what that means? The more you receive grace, the more you share grace. And people who don't share grace, they have never experienced grace. Because grace is so good, you cannot help but become grace. So I talked about how grace changed her to the degree that she became grace. And she came out and she said, it's all a lie. People never change. I tried and I didn't manage. And I tried hard. People cannot change. And I said, I fully agree. She said, you just said that people change. I said, well, you are deaf. You need hearing aids. And I said, what do you mean? You say people cannot change. They don't have the power. I agree. I never said that people have the power. I said that grace accepted in you transforms you. And I said, that's what you never got. You try to change yourself really hard and you fail and you get discouraged or you become a Pharisee. Go to church, sing Kumbaya, smile nice, you go home and you are still who you are. You never understood that grace accepted by faith transforms you above your power. And she says, would you teach me how that grace can come into my life? I said, amen, he just started End of the story. She was baptized. She went back to school. She got a family. She's in the church. So how does grace come into your life? How does it happen? Let's take Abraham. Now we start the sermon. Abraham, the Bible says, the Bible says that Abraham believed. Doesn't say that in, in, in Hebrews, it says that Israel didn't enter the promised land because of their unbelief. When God told Noah, build an ark, God told Noah, invite all the Adventists to enter the ark. Did God say that? Invite all the perfect people to enter the ark. Did God say that? Invite who? Who? What do you mean, everyone? If a sinner, if a drunk, if a stinker would come and by mistake would enter the ark and the door was closed, would he be saved or lost? Why? Because he was inside. He was not outside. We just cannot wrap our mind around that, can we? But I do need to deserve it. Good luck. And so, Abraham believed, and it was credited to him, that's my Bible in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, as 
righteousness. As Abraham believed, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And in the Hebrew, it says, word by word, Abraham believed, and in that moment, he was considered as righteous as God himself. Just think about that. It's a wow. In that moment when you believe, it doesn't say that he was righteous. It says that he was considered. He was still a stinker because just later he says, she's my sister. Uh-uh, she was his wife. You remember? But in the moment you believe, it's not that in that instant you are righteous, but in that moment, grace starts working in you. And you go to school and you graduate first grade and then second grade and third grade. And in this process, because this is... So, you talk about justification in this moment. You are not saint. You are just justified. And then you talk about sanctification and then you talk about glorification. And in this process, we love to talk about justification and glorification, but nobody talks about sanctification. <laughs> If you talk about sanctification, are you a legalist? You follow me? We like to talk about the day of the marriage and then when they get older, but nobody talks on the process in between. We like Israel, we like to get out of Egypt and we like to enter Canaan, the promised land, but nobody likes the wilderness in between. But when Jesus works in you, he takes you to the wilderness and he uses to grow you and it doesn't matter where you are. Here, like the thief on the cross in the beginning of the process, or here, like me, or here, like Mother Teresa, I don't know, or here, like Paul the Apostle, doesn't matter where you are in this growth process from baby to the statue of fullness of Christ, as long as grace is in you, as long as Jesus lives in you, and every day you are in Jesus, in, you are saved. When you separate from Jesus, you can be here, you are lost. Because it's not where you are that saves you, but who lives in you. Because Christ in you, the hope of glory. The Bible says, he who has present continued tense Christ has life. He who has no Christ has no life, period. Pretty simple. You follow me? As long as you are in the process, basically as long as Jesus lives in you, you are safe, not because of you, but because who lives in you. And if he lives in you, there is growth. If there is no growth, it's a theory. He doesn't live in you. He's just singing Kumbaya. If Jesus lives in you, there will be fruits. The fruits are not the efforts of your deeds. Are the result of the work of the Holy Spirit in you, who lives in you. Because they are the fruits of the... The fruits of the Spirit means not your fruits. If you are an apple tree and you try to make banana, you can try forever, even, and you'll never make bananas. You need to be a banana tree to make bananas. It's the fruit of the Spirit. So only the Spirit can produce the fruit of the Spirit. You are a human being, you produce the fruit of the human being. You follow me? So stop trying to produce the fruit of the Spirit. Start inviting the Spirit to live in you. And when grace lives in you, naturally you produce the fruit of the Spirit. You don't produce the fruit to deserve to be a banana tree. You become a banana tree, and as a, re as a result, you produce the fruit. You don't make good deeds to deserve to be God's child. You become God's child, Jesus lives in you, and as a result, you produce fruits. Fruits are not to save you, are because Jesus lives in you. Fruits are not the means to salvation, but the results of God's presence in your life. And so, continuing... Abraham believed in the moment you believe, and that's where you have a problem. That's where we are driving through Montana, going on the glacier, 14,000 feet high. What car were we driving? Who knows? A reliable car. Thank you, Toyota. <laughs> it was a Sienna, our family, me and Mr. Ralph, our friend in the front, my wife on the bench in the middle, comfortable and the two kids, Gabe and Ovi, in the back, playing video games. As we come down from 14,000 feet, you know, instantly I push the brake and I have no brake, zero. The pedal goes all the way to the floor and my car starts going, and I have zero brakes. How do you come down from 14,000 feet, mountain in the left, totally, uh, how to, cliff in the right, how, 180 degree curbs, 
curves. How do you stop the car? Mr. Ralph instantly turned yellow. His hair was like he, he was plugged into the power outlet, like this. Ah! <laughs> My wife, Lord, please, Jesus, please save us. Our kids playing video games and laughing. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Ralph says, are you crazy? Aren't you afraid? And Gabe says, daddy is driving. I'm not a good driver. I'm a crazy driver, but anyway. Why would the kids continue to play video games? And then Gabe says, we have been through tornadoes, we have been through floods. One time the flood took our car and daddy did that and he was talking and Ralph says, stop talking! He says, well, you are scared. You certainly need some counseling. <laughs> What is faith? Faith is not an emotion. It goes to your body and you feel high electricity. Faith, the spirit of prophecy says it's a mind decision to trust God based on his word. And she says, if you know him and if you trust his word, you decide to trust him in spite of what is going on. Abraham decided to believe God in spite of what was going on. What does it mean that he decided to believe God? Let me explain. In the moment you believe, without understanding, without deserving, without being able to change yourself, in the moment you believe, in that moment Jesus takes your filthy sinfulness and puts it above himself as he did what you actually did, and takes his divine, godly, perfect, unbelievable righteousness and puts it on you as you are Jesus. Isn't that absolutely beautiful? And in that moment, he considers you as righteous as God and himself as sinner as you. That's the greatest possible gift in the history of the universe. Should we doubt him? And he starts to work in you. How? Don't ask me. I don't know. But I do know that he does and he is able and he finishes what he starts. Now let me continue a little. Let's learn from Abraham how salvation works. I'm not talking about works. I'm talking about grace. <laughs> how salvation happens. Let's not say works. <laughs> okay. Let's learn from Abraham. Abraham was in Andrews in the seminary, and Sarah was in Andrews in the nursing school. And he sees her and he says, <whistles> she is amazing. And he goes and says, do you want to go for an ice cream? She says, well, I am busy, I have an exam tomorrow. I am busy Friday. Uh, he says, I'm not going to give up. She says, okay, Sunday. And they go together, let's imagine. And after three months, two years, they decided to get married. And they graduate, and they move down to Florida, and they get a job, and they get a car, and they get a house, and they say, now we have a job, we have stability, it's time to have a baby. And they try, and nothing happens. And they try again, nothing happens. And they say, we need, listen carefully, I am talking about how to acquire, not children, but how to acquire Righteousness. They say, we need to eat more tofu and broccoli. Maybe we can have a baby. <laughs> Is it okay to eat healthy? Yes, yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. You are, the, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You should be healthy so you could serve God. Does it save you? No. You understand? Because we feel somehow better than the others because we live healthier. No, it doesn't give you any merits, any salvation. It just helps you to be healthier, period. Okay, and they say, if we eat more broccoli, then we maybe earn salvation. We can have babies. And they start to eat all the broccoli in the world, all the tofu, they still don't have babies. And then they go to the second stage from healthy living. They say, what if we go to a seminar? There is a seminar, so and so, I'm not going to use big names, you know, uh, Sean Boonstra, Mark Finlay. We go to a big seminar. If we learn how to do this and how to do that, then we can have babies. And they go to that doctor in Cincinnati, and they go to that doctor, and they listen to this seminar, and they learn everything about having babies, everything about how to be saved. Another seminar, another lesson, another sermon. They learn everything about babies. They still don't have babies. Do you follow me? And then they go, and they start taking pills. 
and they still don't have babies. And they try and try and try and try and try, and they get 20 and they get 40 and they become 60 and then he is 70 and they say, you know what? We have tried all our life. We have been going to church. We have been eating healthy. We, have been... we still don't have babies. You follow me? You, have, you see the parallel, don't you? Okay. And God doesn't work as long as they try to acquire righteousness in their own methods and efforts. And when they say, we cannot do it, we got too old. Then God says, when you know that you cannot do it, then I'm going to do it for you. Do you follow me? And finally, when Abraham is 75, and Sarah is 65. You need to learn a little more geography. Okay? Then God comes to Abraham and says, look to the heavens. And he looks and says, Do you, can you count the stars? And Abraham says, no. So many will be your seed. Now, to believe that, you really must be crazy because he was already 75. How can you have so many babies even if you had one a year? You follow me? And Abraham says, that's impossible because my wife, did he say that? My wife is too late, you know, she is. Uh, did he say that? What does the Bible say about Abraham? What did he say? It's very, very nice. It says that Abraham believed God in spite. You follow me? He didn't say, Lord, I cannot change myself. Lord, but I am a sinner. Lord, but I have this. Lord, but this. He didn't say anything. He says, if God says so, I don't need to understand how. It's his business how. My business is to trust him. Abraham believed. When we go to prayer, we say, Lord, please, please, please. And then in our mind, I really hope that he works. You understand what I am trying to say? Abraham chose not to doubt God's promise. He didn't say, man, but it's impossible. Think about it. Abraham received the promise when he was 75, and he got the baby when he was 100. 11 years later, when he was 86, God came again and promised again. Have you ever prayed for 11 years? And God says, yes, 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 and nothing happens. He was already 86. And then, even later, when he was 99, God comes again. Imagine, Abraham is 99. He goes to the gas station, he stops the car, he has an old Buick, he gets out of the car, and he's like... <laughs> and Jim, his neighbor across the street says, Abraham, Abraham, and he says, ah. Uh. Hey, do you hear me? Ah. Uh. He says, I heard that you changed your name. Uh-huh. It's not Abraham, it's Abraham. Uh-huh. Do you know what it means? Uh-huh. What? Father of many nations. How many children do you have? None. How old are you? 99. <laughs> you got to be crazy to believe. If you were him, would you believe? But in spite of all impossibilities in him, he said, God can do it. I cannot do it, but God can do it. Uh, he chose not to look to self, but to look to God. And that's where we have a problem. We continue to fix our eyes on impossibilities. We talk about problems. We look to problems. We plan how to solve problems. We just are focused on impossibilities. Instead of taking your eyes off those impossibilities and putting your eyes on God. Because whatever you behold, that's what you think. There is a quotation in the Spirit of Prophecy, powerful. She says, the things that our minds dwell on, probably if you remind me, I'm going to show you the quotation tomorrow, is from another presentation related to this one. There are six of them on how to be saved. And it says, the things that your mind dwells on are the things that transform your mind. Anyway, and so back. Abraham is 99. When God says next year and Sarah starts laughing, <laughs> look at me. You, you understand? It's impossible from a human perspective. It's absolutely crazy. But Abraham chooses to believe not based on what he can do, but based on God's promise. If God promised, it is secure. 
If God promised, it doesn't matter if you are. I was skiing. I am afraid of skiing. I was skiing in, in Wisconsin. It's called the Cascade Mountain. It's not Colorado. Don't worry. It's like a bunny hill compared to Colorado. My kids were on, on, on double, double uh, black diamond or whatever you call it. I was on the bunny hill. And my kids were down, jumping, and shoo, 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 coming from the mountain. I went on the bunny hill. I don't, didn't want to break a leg or, you know, and after that I went and I got a chamomile slash peppermint tea with honey and lemon. I was at the table at the bottom of the mountain watching people who go the, 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 the chair up the mountain and then coming. And instantly I see something crazy. Three guys coming down the mountain, one in the middle, has a paper here round dark glasses and they were screaming left and right blind skier blind skier step aside blind coming on the black diamond i said they are either lying or they are absolutely crazy <laughs> and he's they they were screaming left left right straight little left right straight straight and those whoo they are crazy and they get down and they sit next to me at the same table i am drinking my tea and they are drinking a hot chocolate and i i go with my palm in front of the guy's eyes and I say, you can see. And he says, nope. I said, you can see shadows. He says, no, I was born totally blind. I see nothing. I say, are you crazy? You could have died. And he said, these guys, we grew up together. They are skiing instructors. They are my best friends. I trust them with my life. I have no doubt if they are with me that I am safe. In fact, when I am in my home, I am not as safe as I am on the mountain with them. And I thought about it. That guy trusted two human beings and we doubt God. And then I says that if, we, if, we, if God opened our eyes and we would see God, we would be ashamed of not trusting him. You follow me? Abraham didn't need to understand how God works. He said, hey, if God promises, that's enough. He chose to believe, not based on what he deserves, not based on what he can do, not based on emotions, but based on God's word. That's what you need to keep in mind. So Abraham believed. And, and, and people say, but I don't have faith. But the Bible says that God gave everyone a measure of? How many people did he give? What did he give? A measure of? But Jesus says that if you have faith like a? How big is that measure? Really small. Let me show you that measure. Uh, this is real story. Um, give me a, a prophetic second. Let me get, okay. You see on my finger? That's really a master seed. And that's in Loma Linda. That's a master tree. But if you look carefully in the Greek, where he says that if you have faith like a master seed, it grows and becomes a big tree. The Greek doesn't focus on size, but on characteristics. The Greek focuses on the fact that when you exercise that little faith, it keeps growing until it's really big. So basically, God wants you to take whatever faith you have and use it because whatever you use, that's what you de develop. Exercise faith. Elena says, tuck faith. Don't allow yourself to tuck doubt. Don't allow yourself to think doubt. Tuck faith. Pray faith because she says, whatever you tuck and think, that's what you develop. And so, back, back to the story. Abraham believed. The right is given through faith in Jesus to those who? Because all have sinned, and how many are justified? All who believe. Now listen carefully, folks. I have a problem here. I have a problem here. Uh, so before we get to the problem and to the solution, when was righteousness credited to Abraham? When he left his country because he left his country? When he sacrificed his son because he sacrificed his son? Or before he did anything for God? Before. He was not considered righteous because he sacrificed his son. He sacrificed his son because he was already considered righteous. I don't know if you follow me. Do you understand what I am trying to say? It was not because of what he did. Let me continue a little. 
contrary to any possible hope, he believed. And he was fully convinced that whatever God promised, he is able to perform. Isn't that beautiful? Uh, let me explain a little here. Uh, and we talked about that. We talked about this. I'm going to jump over this. Okay. Okay. So what is your part? And then we move on. Do you have something to do? So number one, you need to believe God's promise. You need to accept his grace by faith. You need to accept his promise. But do you have anything to do? Where does work come into the picture? Because we do. We don't believe in cheap grace. Oh, just believe in God. You don't have to do anything. You can steal. You can kill. That's oh, okay. You'll be saved. We don't believe that, do we? So where do works come in the picture? I'm going to give you a parable and then Bible verses to support it. Let's suppose, let's pretend, let's just imagine that you are broke, you lost your job, you got a paper from the bank that you'll be foreclosed because you didn't pay mortgage, you got a paper from the dealer that your car is going to be repossessed because you didn't pay payments to your car, your shoes broke, your credit card company sent you a paper that they are going to send you to collections because you didn't pay your bill. Do you get a picture? Okay, you owe to the house 500000 or more, you owe to the school loan 100000 you owe to credit card 60000 you owe to the car 40000 you owe to me another 100000 you owe altogether 900000 Is that good or bad? Yeah. Terrible, terrible. Why would you do that, man? Okay. And now, I am your neighbor, and I am Elon Musk. <laughs> okay. I am a multi-billionaire, I am the richest person in the world. And we live in Michigan, and he just knows. And you come to me crying, disparate, disparate. You just are totally disparate. I am disparate. I need to save myself. I am in debt, and I don't know what to do. I need to work. I need to work to pay my debt. Would you please give me some works? That's what we do to be saved. We are looking for what to do instead of whom to know. Can you give me some works so I can pay my debt, so I can solve my problem and be saved? And I look to you and I say, you don't get it. As regardless how much you work, you will never be able to pay your debt. Because whatever salary you are paid is not enough to pay the bills and to eat. Moreover, to pay 900,000. You need grace. And you say, no, 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 give me works. I said, okay, shovel my driveway. How much do you pay me? I'm going to pay you $20 an hour. Is that good or bad? Ah, it's okay, huh? You are two hours, and you get $40. Is it worse or grace? What is it? Works. You work for it. And I give you $40. Does it save you? $40 compared to $900,000? You don't even, if you go to, to grocery store, with $40, you cannot buy anything. Not even, not even candies. You need about $300 to buy food. Am I right? Or more? Moreover, with the inflation. Okay. So you come next day, give me more works because I need to save myself. I said, I gave you works yesterday and you're not able to save yourself. You get farther from the goal because you made debt between yesterday and today to be able to survive. So your debt is even bigger plus the interest. You cannot save yourself with works. You need grace. No, please give me works. I said, it didn't snow last night. There is no snow. I can dig your garden. Thank you, but it's winter. I don't need you to dig my garden. Leave it alone. I can clean your house. I have a lady paid. My house is clean. Please give me works. Works don't help you. Please give me works. Okay, go on. Dust my house. The dust is clean, so you work five minutes. How much should you be paid for five minutes? Maybe two bucks? And I am gracious and I give you $100. Is that works or grace? No, you are wrong. It's both. Because you did work five minutes. So you deserve two bucks. And gracious, I gave you 98 as a gift. That's what we say. Some Adventist. God does a lot, and I do a little too. <laughs> you do nothing. You make a mess, whatever you do. Whatever you do, you just mess it up. God doesn't need your help. <laughs> and then you come next day, because a hunter didn't take care of it. And you say, I'm desperate, give me more works. And I said, you don't get it, but let me help you because of my grace. Sit down. I don't have time to sit down. Sit down. You need grace. Sit down. And you sit down, and you say, can I go now? I need to find work in a different place. If you don't give me work, can I go? Sit down, calm down. Let's know each other. Tell me your life. 
I don't have, tell me your life, don't be anxious, calm down. And you, okay, and you start talking, and you talk two hours, and then you talk two hours because you like to talk too much, and you tell me your life. And then I tell you my life, another two, three hours, and after about four, five, six hours, you say, man, I never knew that you were poor too. And you are so hard to get where you are. And I say, man, I never knew that you went through that stuff. And I say, man, you know, I like you. You are a good guy. And you say, I like you too, man. And we become friends. And I say, now because we know each other and because we are friends, I'm going to do something for you because I love you. And I get my checkbook and I say, how much do you owe? 900,000. And I look to you and I think, and I'm going to write $50 million. Is that good? You are too sad. Okay, 100. Are you happy now? <laughs> yeah, you smile. Okay, $500 million. How, how do you feel about that? You feel good? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, I write the check, $500 million, and give it to you. And you look to the check and you say, come on, stop playing games. That's what we do with God. You say, this is fake. Are you making my life miserable? Come on, give me $100. And I said, this is real. I did that for you. Take it, enjoy it. From now on, you are saved. You can live from the interest. Without working. You and your children, grandchildren, forever and ever and ever, you are done. You are safe. Take the check. And you say, nah, cannot be real. You doubt. Because it's too good to be true. And you feel that you need to pay for everything. You follow me? And I say, take it. And you take it and you go, and you go to the bank and talk to the cashier. Can you check if this is fake or real? <laughs> And the cashier checks and says, yeah, it's covered, it's yours. And you say, can you deposit before he changes his mind? <laughs> she deposits, and then you don't believe. You go into your account and you look and you, ah! oh, you cannot breathe. $500 million in my account. And you start shaking and you almost have a heart attack and you call your wife and says, honey, sit down. And she says, why? You had a car accident. No, I don't have a car. My car is broken. Sit down. And she sits down. The, the kids had an accident. Now sit down. I want you to go online, go on our bank account and look. And she goes online and she, ah! she starts screaming and she drops the phone and she, then she calls her sister and then she calls the kids and then she calls the neighbor and she goes crazy and she calls everybody. And then you think about it and you say, yesterday I was broke and I had no way to save myself. And today I am extremely rich, one of the rich people, you know. And you think about it and you say, how can I pay it back? Even if I live 100 lives, I will never be able to pay it back. And you come back to me, and you get on my neck, and you start crying. And you say, I cannot pay it back. But from the bottom of my heart, with my whole heart, I cannot find the words to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I say, that's okay. No, I love you. You saved me. I love you my life. Listen. I am willing to shovel your driveway forever. I said, you don't need to. No, I don't shovel to pay back. I shovel because I love you. I want to shovel. I have a desire to shovel. And then you say, I want to shine your shoes. I say, you don't need to. Yes, because I love you. You love me so much, I really want to do it. It would make me feel really good. Would you let me shine your shoes? I said, no need. And then you say, can I cook for you? And you want to do something not to receive money. You already received money. You want to do something because you love me and you understand that what I did for you, it's amazing. That's where works come into the picture. If you contemplate grace and understand what God has done for you, you cannot help yourself but serve and say, Lord, you died for me. I want to do something for you. Not to be saved, but because I love you. And if you don't have a desire to do something for God, it's because you never got the grace. Because when you fix your eyes on the grace, you love to do something for God. It's not sacrifice. It's a privilege. You understand what I am trying to say? That's where works come into the picture. It's a privilege. Now, talking about that, Abraham understood that. Let's jump a little because our time is up. Oh, it is up. We started late. Not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> let's jump a little. I'm looking what slides to jump to. By the way, let's go, to uh, let's go through a few paragraphs. Can an Ethiopian change his skin? Or leopard, his spots? Neither you, neither you. You follow me? 
Paul says, I don't do what I want, but I do what I hate. Who is going to save me? And then he says, praise be to God. Who? Who saves me? It is God and God and God alone who does 100% all and you do zero. But if you understand and believe and accept by faith, the grace gift accepted by faith is going to change you. Because when you fix your eyes on his cross, when you fix your eyes on his gift, when you fix your eyes on heaven, it's going to totally get your heart because God's love compels us. The more you understand love, the more you fix our eyes, your eyes on him. The more you understand the Calvary, the more you understand love, the more you are filled with his presence and his love. And the more you love him. And the more you love him, that love grows bigger and bigger as you keep your eyes on his cross. That love grows bigger and bigger to the degree that there is no more room for love for other things. That love shadows the love for anything else. That love takes the place, replaces the other things. Because when you love him so much, you have no more room to love other things. If you love other things, it's because you don't love him. Do you follow me? That's how transformation happens. Not by human effort, but by God's presence and God's love living in you. That love grows to the degree that you are addicted to God and you have no more time for other loves or other addictions. And so, money, talking about salvation and righteousness, money cannot buy it. Intellect cannot procure it. Wisdom cannot attain it. You can never hope in human effort to secure it. But God gives you as a gift. Isn't that powerful? Steps to Christ 49. And people who say, brother, I'm okay. They are so far, they have no hope. The greater the distance between you and Christ, listen, the more righteous you think that you are. Those that live near to Jesus why do I read this? In a second, you know why. It's very important. Those who live near to Jesus, the closer you are to Jesus, the worse you feel about yourself. You say, man, I am desperate. I am a sinner. I, Paul says, I am the chief of all sinners. So let me tell you why I tell you this. People call me and say, Pastor, I started to fix my eyes on Jesus. I started to pray. I started to study, and I am feeling worse. I said, good news. Pray the Lord you feel bad. Because if you felt good, it means you have no clue about Jesus' righteousness. But when you started to put your eyes on him, finally you realize that you have cancer. And you feel bad. You are sick always. You just didn't know. You thought you are okay. You are blind and you didn't know that you are blind. Now you know that you are blind. And now you know how desperate you need Jesus. I said the fact that you feel bad, it means that you got closer to Jesus. Because close to him, you finally realize. And the closer you are to him, in fact, you don't feel better. You feel worse. Because compared to Jesus, you are worse. Compared to people, you may be better, you know. I look to myself and to you. I am a saint compared to you. You are sinners, you know. (laughs) When you fix your eyes on Jesus, then you realize how you are. Then you know that you need him even more. And you seek him more. And you love him more. And you know him more. And you trust him more. And that's when he takes over. Isn't that beautiful? Let's continue quick because we need to finish. When we don't fix our eyes on the cross, we try to replace God's righteousness with the things that we do. And that's the reason. You remember the Bible verse in Psalm 50 that says, gather my people that have made a covenant to me through sacrifice. And we say, we got to give something, we got to do something, some sacrifice. And we don't get it. The covenant between us and God is through sacrifice, but not your sacrifice. The covenant is based on his sacrifice. And so therefore, we need to understand clearly that salvation is a person. That the closer you get to that person, Jesus, and the more you know him, eternal life is to know. The more you know him, the more without human effort you are transformed. The Spirit of Prophecy says, at the foot of the cross, as we behold his sacrifice, we are transformed from grace to grace, from glory to glory, into his image without human effort. I put it in my words. I do have the paragraph. At the foot of the cross, when you fix your eyes on him, 
His presence sanctifies you. His presence in you changes you. You cannot change yourself, but His presence will do it. That's the reason in heaven you'll say, I don't deserve it, it was all you. And when you understand that, that's when you love Him and you want to serve Him. Let's try to finish a little because I'm already hungry. I'm going to jump. <clears throat> okay, this is a good paragraph. You are a sinner. You cannot atone for your past sins. Even if you live perfect from now on, what do you do with the past? You, you understand? You cannot change your heart and make yourself holy. But God promised to do all of this for you through Christ. You must believe that promise. You don't need to understand. You don't need to feel it. I was talking to a lady and she was uh, head elder for 70 years. And she said, Pastor, I am lost. I cannot believe that I am saved. I said, how do you know? Because I prayed all my life that God forgives what I did when I was 20. I said, what? You prayed all your life that God would forgive you for what you did when you were 20 and now you are 90? She said, yes. I said, lady... You don't have a sin problem. You are a saint. Because I have to pray for every day for what I do. Not for what I did when I was 20, you know. I do stupid stuff every day. I said, you are a saint if you sinned only when you are 20. <laughs> you understand? I said, I am praying for everyday sins. She said, no, no, no. I do sin every day, but that sin was bigger. I said, oh, you measure them. <laughs> I said, in my opinion, when you cut an electrical wire, doesn't matter if you cut one meter or one uh, millimeter. Electricity still doesn't go through. When you cut your connection, in my opinion, big sin, small sin, you are called lost. <laughs> Say, well, but that's a big sin. In our opinion, if I go to church and I criticize my brother a little, it's a small sin. But if I kill somebody, it's a big sin. I didn't commit any sins. I just criticized my brother. <laughs> Give me a break. And so, I was talking to her and she says, I am lost. God never forgave me. And I said, lady, you ask forgiveness, yes. In the moment that you ask forgiveness, how many times do you ask after? Hundreds of times. That's hundreds too many times. Because the Bible says, when you confess, God forgives. In the moment you confessed, in that moment he forgave you. In fact, he paid on the cross before you sinned, before you were born. And the check was there, waiting for you to cash it. He paid for your sin before you were born. And I said, Jesus' blood is... And she said, but my sin is big. I said, how big? Big. I said, what if your sin is like the earth? She said, bigger. Like, like Mount Everest. And I said, hey, God's grace is like the universe. From the universe, you don't even see Mount Everest. God's blood is sufficient. God's grace is sufficient. And she said to me, can I be saved? And I said, yes. I, she said, how? I said, simply, confess and believe. And she said, and then, how do I make sure that I don't sin? I said, well, the Bible says in... John 15, you need to abide in him. You need to remain. You need to keep your eyes on him. Because when you separate, Satan attacks you. When you are in him, Satan has no access. And she said to me, it's too simple. I said, yeah, that's the reason kids can be saved and adults cannot because they like complications. They complicate everything that is simple. They cannot live happy unless they complicate simple stuff. And she says, would you pray for me? Yes. Why don't you pray for yourself? God doesn't listen to me. I said, you need to go to a different church if you need a priest to intercede for you. <laughs> God listens to everybody, in my opinion, because God loves everybody. But I said, I will pray for you. I prayed and she prayed. And then she says, how do I know now that I am forgiven? I don't feel it. And I was like, Bzzz! I said, hey, I felt it. I am forgiven. <laughs> I said, are you mocking me? I said, yes. I said, you want to feel forgiveness? Do you think that forgiveness is something that goes to your body and you feel it? And I said, forgiveness, you don't feel, you don't touch, you don't smell, you don't see, you don't deserve, you don't explain. Forgiveness is by faith. How can you feel, feel forgiveness? Think about the word forgiveness. How do you feel forgiveness? I said, yeah, you are right. Gr grammatically, you are right. I said, not grammatically, practically. You don't feel forgiveness. You take it by faith. God promised God doesn't lie, period. When you confess, you are forgiven. And she said, so I am forgiven. Yes. I said, oh, praise the Lord. I never knew it. Can you imagine a life head elder in the church and never experience grace? That's where we are. 
We think we are better folks, yet we struggle to forgive others. Why? Because we have never received forgiveness and you cannot give what you don't have. Only when you receive it, you share it. It flows through you. When God gives you grace, you become grace. And so, long story, I'm not going to go to a story. I talked to her. She was totally transformed by God's grace. Listen, if you believe, you are made whole. Do not wait to feel, but say, because what you say influences how you think. Don't talk negative. Say, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. Not because I feel it, not because I deserve it, but because God cannot lie. And then praise God in advance for the promise. Through the simple act of believing God, the Holy Spirit has already started a new life in your heart. You are a child born into the family of God and He loves you. He loves you. He loves you as much as He loves Jesus, His Son. God loves you as much as He loves Jesus. That should be enough for you to jump up and down and scream and be happy. Am I right? As you read God's promise, they are love and pity. He's drawn to you with boundless compassion. As you draw near to him with confession and repentance, he'll draw near to you with mercy, forgiveness, and a new life. Beautiful. Beautiful, isn't it? Let's finish here because we, our time is up. I want to give you a story when we finish. Have you read Dave Rover's story? Anybody has read Dave Rover? Dave Rover? No, no. Okay, good. Then I can tell the story. Dave Rover was in Vietnam and he was in a special unit and they were supposed to go in a place where nobody ever got because they all got killed on the way there. And so they got on the river on a boat and as they got on the river, they turned the engine off and they were moving quietly in the night to pass any enemy point. And they were moving up the river quietly in the middle of the night, no lights, no sound. As they were moving up, one of the enemies started a, a light to smoke and he saw them and threw a phosphorus grenade. Anybody knows what is a phosphorus grenade? In the moment it explodes, it sprays phosphorus on everybody and as long as there is oxygen, you keep burning and nobody, nothing can stop the fire unless you take the oxygen out. When the grenade dropped into the boat, he knew that all his soldiers are going to die burning. So he threw the grenade in the water and it exploded in his hand. He took his hand, part of his face, part of his body, part of his stomach, part of his tummy, and then he started to burn. And they could not stop the fire, so he jumped in the water. But in the water, he needed to breathe, so he came above the water. As soon as his head was above, when the oxygen was there, it started to burn again. So he got under the water, and they gave him a straw. But they had to get him out from under the water. So they prepared the blanket. They got him out, the fire started, they covered him in blankets and put a straw. Took him to hospital. He was in hospital in coma for several months. When he recovered, he asked for a mirror. And the doctor said, no, please don't look in the mirror. Give me a mirror. Eventually, he got a mirror. He says, I look like a monster. He had no eye, no nose, no ear, no cheek here, no arm, no leg, part of the stomach missing, and a plastic bag here. And he said, I cannot live this way. There is nothing I can do to change myself, nothing I can do to deserve to live, nothing I can do ever to change anything about my life. I would rather die because I have zero hope. Nobody can help me, no doctor, nobody. And the nurse came to him and says, God loves you and died for you, and he can make your life worth he says, nobody, I don't deserve, not even my wife is going to love me. Nobody, look at me. Nobody can love somebody that looks this way. 
A day later, the soldier next to him that was missing only one leg, his wife came to visit him, saw him without a leg, took the ring and said, I am divorcing. And Dave says to the nurse, you see what I am talking about? If that lady divorced him for missing a leg, who can look at me and still love me? I am unlovable. There is no hope for me. I said, God loves you, not because of who you are or how you look, but because of his sacrifice for you. And you'll never understand the amount of his love because it's beyond human understanding. Even in heaven, you'll never understand a drop. Angels cannot understand his love. God loves you. He says, that's baloney. I'm going to show you that nobody loves me. A few weeks later, his wife came. He covered himself. She says, honey, let me see you. No, go away. I have no hope. Honey, I love you. No, if you see me, you are going to hate me. You are going to get scared. You are going to have bad dreams every night. Go away. I love you, honey. Go away. Honey, I look ugly. Honey, you never look good to begin with. She pulled the blanket. She came close and kissed him and said, I love you not because of who you are or how you look like. I loved you because when I married you, I loved you to begin with. And she said, for what you did to save the other soldiers, I love you even more. Amen. And she says, come home, Dave. That's the name of the book. Come home, Dave. I want you with me. You belong with me. I love you. He says, he was talking to a group of people about how salvation works. He says, in that moment, I understood how grace works. And he was talking to the people, and he had a fake eye, and a fake plastic ear, and a fake nose. And he says, in that moment, I understood, and his ear fell off. And everybody like, oh! And he put the ear back, and everybody was saved. The Bible says to understand the love of God that surpasses any understanding. How can you understand something that surpasses understanding? In eternity, in heaven, forever and ever and ever and ever, we are going to contemplate God's love and God's works and we are going to be in awe and say it's something that we, with our brain, cannot grasp. It's beyond any type of understanding and we are going to be ashamed that we doubted God's power and love to save. He saved the thief on the cross. He saved the woman at the well. He saved Mary. He saved Rahab. He can save you and me. He is able. And he loves you. But you need to trust in him. And fix your eyes on him. Because the more you understand that love, that love in you is your single hope. That presence in you is the single way that you can grow. And as long as Jesus lives in you, you are safe, not because of how you are, but because God is in you, working in you. And you may be perfect. If you separate from Jesus and he doesn't live in you, you are lost, regardless that you are perfect. God's presence in you saves you, not your perfection. You understand? Therefore, we need to keep our eyes on his cross continually as our only hope. Christ and Christ alone. There is no other name. You understand? Make a decision tonight. Make a decision tonight. Make the goal of your life, the desire, the reason to live. To daily, continually, again and again, every time Satan would tempt you to turn your eyes, to turn back and fix your eyes. As Paul says, I forget what is behind. I run for the goal ahead and I fix my eyes on the captain of my salvation. To fix your eyes on Jesus. Because the more you know him and the more you understand that grace, the more that love takes over and changes you and you become love and you become grace and God lives in you. Isn't that beautiful? There is no human effort that can do that. But his presence is going to do it. No question. 
There is no way to be lost if Jesus leaves you in you. And there is no way to be saved if Jesus is out of you. And we know that, yet we try to do it in human power. And that's the reason we are miserable, and that's the reason we don't save anybody. Because you need to give them the real hope for people to come. Make a goal that from now on, you seek him more than anything else, more than job, more than cars, more than life. You seek him first. You keep your eyes on him. 